Uh, so, the premise of this is I'm just going to look at the kit in a vacuum, basically. Well, not a complete vacuum, but... Uh, and I'm going to evaluate each card in terms of how much power budget does this take up in the character's kit. Power budget is the idea that not every card is created equal, and that's fine. Um, you need to have different tools for different situations, and part of how characters are balanced is that, like, good cards tend to have good boosts. You have to choose which way to spin the card. Alright, without going into a whole lot more of that, let's wander over here. And take a look at Gabrick. So Gabrick was uh, Season 1's archetypal grappler, at least in theory. He has a few really amusing traits in that regard. Uh, but let's start by looking at his character ability. Before choosing his attack, if Gabrick's at range 1, he draws a card. Um, the current template of this would be before setting cards for a strike, uh, if you are at range 1, draw a card. So this has the drawback of it can actually land you in hot water with reading, because if you're at range 1 and they use reading, you draw before choosing cards, which is weird, right? Before setting your attack, you draw a card, and then you might draw the thing they're reading, so that's unfortunate. But it has the massive advantage otherwise of you're drawing cards all the time, if, as long as you're in combat at close range. So obviously this dude likes range 1, right? This ability is good. Uh, it's not exceptional, but it's good. Like, being able to draw a card whenever a strike happens at range 1, that's great. That means you're going to passively tend to push, not passively, but like, you will naturally be pressuring your opponent into corners because you'll be moving into them and they'll be moving away because they don't want a strike to get away. They want to get away outside of strikes. So it turns into an awful lot of footsies outside of strikes. <coughs> All right. Uh, so yeah, this is, this is a good ability. Now, let's evaluate all these cards. Uh, one, one thing is worth noting, by the way. This doesn't really change any attack shapes, right? Uh, it's just you draw a card. It doesn't give you power, it doesn't give you speed, it doesn't change any of your attack properties. Nothing to do with critical, that's a little season mechanic in season 3. So uh, bas that basically means we can look at these cards as they are. The ability doesn't change them. I didn't talk about his exceed yet, but it also does not change his abilities. Or his attacks, rather. <coughs> Alright. Uh, first, let's talk about one of the most infamous cards in all of Exceed, Rolling Ankle Grab. So, this card is not as bad as it looks, but it is, like, famously bad, as in it's, uh, iconically bad. Because this is a speed 2 card with no printed defense, no armor, no guard. It looks awful. It's only power 5, it doesn't ignore armor, it doesn't ignore guard, it, it doesn't have a hit effect that gets you out of range, it doesn't have an after effect that gets you out of range. So it's a speed 2 card that loses to anything faster than it, and it loses to anything slower than it. That's terrible. Like, my goodness. Um, Willing Ankle Grab is clearly a card which can't really be played unless it has some sort of boost on it. It needs Defend, or it needs some sort of Guard boost, or something else. Uh, otherwise, this is only good against somebody who literally has no projectiles or no other ranged options. Importantly, it closes 4 spaces, meaning it hits at range 5. Which is a range that a lot of characters just don't hit, naturally. So it has an each use in that regard. However, it's still extremely predictable. Hmm. Uh, it is a bad card. It has a use. The use is important to Gabrick, but very, very weak. Uh, let's look at this boost. The opponent must use a wild swing the next strike. If not range one when you play this, discard it. Excuse me? You're spending a turn and a card to make the opponent use a wild swing, and wild swings are generally already pretty good. It also requires to be at range 1 when you play it, which means that you're spending a turn at range 1 not striking. Um, yeah, forcing opponents to wild swing is typically used to, like, prevent them from playing specific answers. So it does have a function in Gabrick's kit, in the context of his kit, as you'll see in a second here, because I happen to know something very interesting about Gabrick's kit. Um, but it's costing him a lot to do that when he really could just be striking. Like, make them use the answer and then just keep going. That's the usual grappler way. Alright, so I just alluded to something interesting about Cabric's kit, and I should probably talk about that now. Willing Ink Grab, speed 2, no defense. Chokehold is range 1, guard 5, but no movement. Lunar Launcher is range 1, speed 6. Perilous Ascent is uh, range 3 to 4, really, but speed 4, no guard. Shrug Off, range 1 to 2, 
armor 5, but range 1 and 2, no movement. Range 1, speed 6, no defense, no movement. Range 1, speed 0, no movement. All of these lose to grasp. All of them. Every single special. Every single ultra. If you play grasp on defense, none of Gabrick's cards do anything. Uh, that's comical, right? However, if you try to play, you know, a sweep on defense, he has nothing that beats that. If you're at mid-range and you play a sweep or a focus, you can beat that, right? Uh, and Shrug Off doesn't lose very hard to grasp, but it has five armor, right? So if you're faster than Shrug Off, he doesn't care. He just he takes five less damage from whatever you do, so he's fine. Uh, and if he can't afford an ultra, then you're just going to take a billion damage if you play something that doesn't get you out of the way. So, like, you need to have grasp to be able to answer his stuff. Because otherwise, it's pretty decent. His power values are a little underwhelming, though. Anyway. All that to say, if he can force his opponent to wild swing, like so, it means that they're not going to play the grasp that they've been holding in their hands, waiting, to, waiting for just such an occasion. Uh, however, spending a turn boosting this just feels wasteful. So the boost is awful, and the attack is quite bad. Uh, it will get slightly better if he has other defense in his kit, like if he has a guard boost, but right now it's just terrible, because he has to play defend for it to be worth anything. Ah, okay. Here we go. Three guard, five guard. So he has other guard boosts. Uh, none over there. Alright, let's look at these attacks to decide how worthwhile it is to boost them. Chokeholds. 144 with 5 guard. This is an interesting stat line. It's kind of the middle of the road stat line, which means it's not actually good, but it's also not bad. Uh, before plus 3 power if the opponent used a wild swing. Okay, that hits 7. 7 is an important number. Hit your opponent must discard cards or enemy until they have 2 in hand. Oh wow. So that's basically a season 1 eviscerate. Eviscerate is a card in Galdred's kit in season 2. Um, that's actually extremely punishing. So th this is our command grab. This is our backbreaking special um it's a little bit interesting because like you have to land it and it's not very reliable it's not very easy to confirm even with light this is only speed six so it's always under curve um and the guard is nice but it only really matters if the opponent walks into you right if they're faster than this they're probably going to be getting out of the way and if people assault into gabrick why like why are they doing that um so this is a card that's hard to confirm but excellent if it lands uh, and very, very punishing in certain situations. Not actually a bad card. Especially because this hit effect is just brutal. Yikes. Uh, so lumbering, three guard and close two. Eh, close two is nice. Three guard is nice. Playable. Very playable, actually. That's that's a nice little boost. Um, three guard lets EX attacks hit magic number five very, very easily. Uh, it also means that this thing suddenly counters cross and also Grasp. So yeah, I would say that this did get a little bit better, just because of this boost. And this attack is... not bad. Um, he doesn't seem to have a good way to confirm it, at least not yet. But it's it's a, a pretty important part of his kit, I would say. Like, and that's without even having to view the rest of it. This is shaped like a scary grappler command grab. The only drawback is it requires the opponent's wild swing for it to get its big power spike. Otherwise, it's just as the hit effect. And if you're up against somebody who's willing to fight at low hand size, it suddenly gets really mediocre. Alright, let's take a look. Lunar Launcher. Uh, this is another command grab. So this beats sweet because it has hit move the opponent up to three spaces after move one. So it has all the evasion for uh, unless the opponent plays focus, right? If you can't move the opponent, Lunar Launcher is terrible. But if you can move the opponent, you can dodge everything. It's great. Uh, that after effect is also nice because it lets you move in if you're starting from range, even if you miss. So this has that niche use uh, that you'll see, and actually a number of Season 1 Speed 6 cards have this, where like, uh, oh, and Tinker Knight's Flail has this, uh, where at Speed 6 you get after movement that lets you reposition a little bit, which is really just like a way of making an attack that's a quick sidestep. Um, the hit effect is the meat of the attack, the after effect is like, uh, we wanted him to have a little bit of a sidestep here, so he gets that too. At least that's my interpretation. As an attack, this is very bad, but that after is actually probably pretty useful for him. 
um, since, as we will continue to see, he doesn't deal with projectiles very well. So just having a, I'll spin this card to move one step closer, that's that's really nice to have. Because uh, if he's at range 3 and you're throwing a 3-6 to six projectile or whatever, he can step in, and that means it's a lot harder to pressure him with various projectiles. Uh, no remorse plus 5 guard. I mean, that's 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 a good boost, except, right? It's a good boost, except it's only good on this. Because plus 5 guard means you're not going to get stunned, but it doesn't mean you're likely to hit the opponents if they are evading you, right? So plus 5 guard is good on assault or anything else with close movements, because close is very good at making sure you hit the opponents. Um, so actually, this is very good on this as an attack. And it's pretty reasonable. Um... Other than that, though, the boost doesn't seem like it's all that good. Attack, niche use, not not great. Boost, niche use, not great. Still feels like a tool that he needs. Um, so together, these two make up one copy of Vanishing Flat or Green Hands in Zangief's kit, right? Like, these two cards together have the amount of power which the Vanishing Flat has because it's the way that you can reposition a little bit against projectiles, it's the way that you can guard through something and come in. Um, like, Banishing Flat does a bunch of things all at once. These two cards, when put together effectively, do those things. Or you slap Defend or whatever on this, but like you're having to commit additional resources, which is already a problem. So these are not great. But they're useful, right? They're not trash. Rolling Ink Grab is a card that you have to throw another card onto to make it good, but once you do, it serves a function. Alright. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jay observes he likes the fact that Chokehold has the property of punishing opponents who mash buttons. Yeah, the, the wild swing the button mash, right? Somebody who is willing to just flail and accept that they lose gets heavily punished by, by this, uh, and often by command grabs in general, right? Like, command grabs tend to punish about half of the opponent's options. So if you're not playing to beat them, and the opponent and the person playing the command grab is watching your discards, then they know that statistically you're not likely to think to throw the thing that beats it. Unless you see it coming. Alright, let's look at Perilous Ascent. Uh, 144, ignore guard before advance 3. So this is an on-curve ignore guard option. That's great. On-curve ignore guard is really good. Now, it's only on curve at range 4, other than that it's under curve and it doesn't even hit at range 1 or 2. So, not without its flaws, right? But this is dive. Uh, it's a dive that gets full value at range 3, which dive, oh, sorry, at range 4, which dive itself does not, right? Dive at range 4, you're actually vulnerable to sweeping focus, this thing isn't. It does less damage in return though, but, you know, gets you to range 1, ignore guard, that's actually great. Um, personally... Yeah, that feels super strong to me. Because, um, like, normally what a grappler wants to do at range 3 is throw assault. Um, he's got this thing. So he has an extra copy of dive. Right? Uh, which means that you can play dive twice, and you can play assault and spike the other times. And that's non-trivial. Um, reach? Reach is good specifically at range 2. If opponents are looking to play footsies, uh, Range 2 Grasp is uh, get back over here, and also is the way to turn cards like this, which are under curve at range 1, into being on curve. Uh, it also can create board states where chokeholds is practically unbeatable by the things that the opponent has left. Right? If they're out of crosses, then there are board states where reach chokeholds doesn't lose anything, because it, it doesn't lose Grasp anymore. Right? Like, if Gabrick is in the corner, reach chokehold doesn't lose Grasp. That's pretty cool. So Reach is good. Uh, it's probably on him for mostly thematic reasons, honestly. Reach is very common on characters who are big body grapplers, like dudes who are just big. And Gabrick's clearly a big dude. But it's a good boost. Um, it makes this on curve. It does absolutely nothing. It's rolling equal grab. It makes chokehold occasionally unbeatable. And then on normals, of course, it's fantastic, right? You stand in the center of the board and you play Reach Sweep and you're just going to hit them. Now you'll probably trade, but whatever, dude. Trading with sweep is good. Alright. Shrug off. 1, 2, 3, 3, 5. 
Uh, this is like the Season 1 version of Season Desist, which is a card on Carl Swanchi's kit in uh, Season 2. It's interesting, because it's speed 3, prep ton of armor, with after lose all armor. So... Uh, yeah, and Jay accurately observes reach is also amazing at range 1. It means you can catch cross with sweep and such. But yeah, so... so 5 armor is a ton, right? So this, this card actually says, any fast pokes you have, I can just ignore. And that's great, right? Because we have seen this guy, he's not on curve, right? Like, th this is on curve at range 4, but he wants to be closer. Everything loses to grasp. Everything loses to cross. Uh, you're going to get poked a decent amount, and anybody who has a projectile is going to throw it at you, because you don't have a really good way to deal with projectiles. So, this is probably going to be effectively another four points of life on, on the average time that you play it. Like, probably three to four points of life when you play it. Uh, it usually won't be tanking all five damage, because at five, like, that usually means somebody's playing a dive, right? And nobody's going to dive into Gabrick, probably. You might dive past him, though. So, shrug off, pretty good. I would say that it's, like, noticeably better than these two cards, because it's going to get value more often than these are. These cards you basically have to be in various, in certain positions to get full value, or they are serving a very specific function, where Shrug Off is like the general purpose tool against a bunch of things. I'd probably put it right alongside Chokehold, honestly. Uh, Chokehold being the punish, and Shrug Off being the kind of safe defense where you just don't care what the opponent does. Uh, what was the boost in Shrug Off? Spent a 6 life draw one card for life spent? I mean, okay, but... Oh, okay. I was about to say, why is he out of cards in the first place? Well, he's out of cards because people are playing footsies, right? People are going to be backing up, he's going to be closing in, he never gets to use his ability because they're not ever striking, they're just running away. Which means that this is the, alright, screw it. If we're not trading, then I'll just trade a bunch of life for the cards I need to chase you. So that's actually pretty good. Um, up to six, notably, means that even if you're at zero cards other than this, right? Like, you have this, use your one card in your hand, you play it, you spend six life, you draw six, you draw for another turn, you have seven cards. Complete reload. It's awesome. It does mean that you're losing a ton of life, which means you, you probably can't boost both copies, right? You can boost one copy and then play the attack from the other to get the extra effect of life. Um, it's it's a good boost. Uh, it, it's definitely a good boost. Hmm. Do I think Shrugoff is better than his character building in terms of overall power budget? No. His character ability shapes the way that the match plays out too much. Alright. Actually, before we talk about Ultras, let's look for the Succeed, right? 3 gauge Exceed, because it's Season 1. Uh, if he initiates at range 1, this opponent must defend with the Wild Swing. Alright. Remember all the reasons Intimidate was bad? It takes a turn, it costs a card, right? Like, it passes a turn to the opponent so they can do something else. None of those drawbacks. So this is actually good, and it's sp specifically good because it means he can proc this thing without the opponent choosing to play into it, right? You get up in their face, you make them wild swing, and now you have a 1, 7, 4 hit the opponent discards until they have discards cards at random until they have two cards left in hand. Which is terrifying. Um, wow, this kind of makes me want to play Gabrick. Right? Like, Chokehold becomes really scary against Exceed Gabrick. Or when you're, yeah, when you're fighting Exceed Gabrick. And then if the opponent initiates, he draws a card, which is the same as his one set ability, right? Because um, when they initiate, is is timing-wise before he chooses, so it's the same timing. Uh, Jay says he sees a whole bunch of cards that are great for surviving one corner, and a character who isn't likely to get cornered in the first place. They're covering weaknesses he doesn't have. I would not agree with, with, like, all of that. So, um, Shrug Off, I think, is good at surviving in a lot of cases. Perilous Ascent is obviously not a win corner card. It's terrible when you're cornered. Chokehold, I think, is a punish. I don't think it's really... Like, reach chokehold is obviously the thing that works when you're cornered. But I think chokehold is just there as the punish tool. Lunar Launcher, I guess, is the thing that you do when you're cornered, because it doesn't work if the opponent's cornered. Right, like, that's when it's actually bad. But it is good at cornering the opponent, which is important. And then Rag is not related to being in the corner at all. I guess I guess it is because you throw a defend on it and then you cover cross, right? And you expect people to cross when you're cornered. Um... Alright, so how good is the succeed ability? Actually better than I give it credit. So a lot of the re so I often badmouth abilities like this because I'm like, well, you're making the opponent wild swing. They should be wild swinging anyway, right? Like half the time. 
people should be wild teaming more than they are because you should be like initiating from hands when you know what when you know it's good or if you're at a good range initiate from deck right it's like you ha you know the distribution of cards in your deck or you should uh in competitive play obviously i don't expect casual players to memorize their decks but like you, you should be able to figure it out so given that figure out your favorite range and initiate strikes uh and then if you're defending with wild swings well that's just conserving resources it's just sensible right if you don't know what the opponent's playing don't guess play play safer than that save your resources so that you can play something that you know will win anyway all that to say being forced to wild swing means you can't play any x attack you can't play an answer you've been saving you can't play a card that the opponent knows you have in hand because they parried or reading or whatever right like it's that's that's a big deal especially in the late game which is when he's going to be exceeding obviously he does not have any gauge generation um he has to actually land hits which pro probably is going to require normals because these cards are not very good at confirming so in the late game when he has to succeed and he's making you wild swing then you're far enough through your deck that you're going to be you're going to have saved your best answers unless you just didn't draw into them and of course if you're post reshuffle that's then that's not even the possibility like you you drew into them and so if you wanted them you kept them now we can make you not use them that's deceptively good um proportionately none of these cards have a like particularly stellar amount of power budget i feel like the band is tighter on gabrick than it is in most characters that i've looked at where like all of these cards like perilous ascent isn't that much better but Gabrick also isn't that much better. But these cards aren't that much better. Like these are all these are all smushed together a bit. Um, except for Hack. <coughs> except for Link and Grab. It's like the 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 distance from his least budgeted card to his most budgeted card is is not as great as I make it look. Oh, speaking of power. Those are numbers. Alright. Um, well, let's look at the really simple one first. Charge in, close up to three. Literally the same as run, right? Except for worse. And it's on an ultra. This boost is garbage. This boost is a one force discount on the move action. It's terrible. Um, now, on a special, that's not like particularly bad but you still want to do something extra like usually if a special says close two or retreat two it does something else um and that's a one force discount right like that's a one card that moves you two spaces and then you do something else this is an ultra that moves you three spaces and then that's it it's bad five gauge excuse me five gauge is a lot range one Power 13, speed 6. Alright, so it's under curve. Um, so it's a mid speed, and boy, is it a mid speed. That is 13 power. That destroys everything. It's lower than it, right? Like, it loses to grasp. That's it. You initiate, you beat everything else. If you EX it, it beats everything. Uh, this is an amazing card. The only problem is it costs 5 gauge. So, how much do I think he's actually required to play this card? Not that much. I think it's going to be hard for him to collect and save two copies when he's going to have to play footies as much as he is, so he can't reliably hold the EX. And if you can't reliably hold the EX, then you're gambling when you want to throw this thing. That's dangerous. Um, like, he does not have a good way to confirm it except for Reach, which is another force, another card, and he has to be at range 2, which, you know, he could probably do. Uh, but yeah, he like he's not exceeding and doing this. That's eight gauge. That's a ton of gauge on somebody who does not have good ways to confirm cards for the most part. So, the card is extremely powerful, but do I actually think it's like consuming a lot of power in this kit? Not really. And I think that's part of why it has a mediocre boost on it. Is that oftentimes the attack just isn't going to be practical because you don't generate resources enough to be able to afford to commit five gauge on this ultra. Uh, you'll often just need to play this boost to get closer, to keep throwing other stuff so that you can eventually build up enough gauge to just exceed. Like, that alone will be a challenge. Alright, let's take a look at Death Valley Faceplant. 110, 0, 7 guard. 
Hmm, don't see a lot of printed seven guard. There's a few in season one. There's one in season. Is at least one. Uh, in season five, yes, there is. It's been previewed already. I have to think about that. Uh, four plus three power if you want to use a wild swing. So this can hit thirteen power a lot more easily, to be honest. Um, and it's not appreciably harder. It is appreciably harder to land. Who are we getting? Right, speed zero. So it'll lose to dive and cross every time of day. Uh, it's also not as safe to throw it at low life because you get hit first, right? You're not outspeeding anybody with this thing. If they wild swing, there's a decent chance you just explode them for a ton of damage. Um, but yeah, not super good, not not super well confirmed. This is a good card. I actually think it's less, like, less important to him than 13 story because I think 13 story when you want to hit it, you can hit it. Especially because of Reach here. Death Valley, there's no good way to make sure this hits. Monster Strength, plus your power and strike. Whoa. Um, that's an extremely good boost. That's an amazing boost. If he had more stuff that was on curve, it would be completely st Like, it'd be insane. It'd be stellar. As it is, he's going to play that on normals. He's going to play that on, like, sweep, focus, assault, grasp. Right? Like, when the opponent can't cross out, especially with the assault. Uh... That's fantastic. That's a, that's a really good boost. I think we just ignore this attack, honestly. And this boost sits like up here. Ultras are a big deal for him. All right, so that's that's my analysis of Gabrick. Essentially, is he has the punish tool, the bad punish tool, great boost, the epic tool that you'll probably never be able to afford if we're honest. A good card, a good ability. Well, these are probably like on par with each other. The boring thing that just says, I have no life and I need cards, or sorry, I have no life because I obtained cards, or I have more life than I deserve. Um, and then these cards, which are notably less impressive. 